This lesson is about XWD. XWD is an X program that will grab images from the screen and write them to a file. It's quite flexible really, but you have to know how to use it. Let's start off by taking a simple snapshot of a single window. To run the fundamental XWD, all you have to do is name its output file, like this. It's customary to use XWD as a suffix on the file because there are some display and conversion routines that like it that way. I'll be showing you how those work in the next lesson. You can use the cursor to select the window that you want to shoot. It's important that the window not be obscured because XWD can't shoot through anything. Now we can use the display command to see what we got. The frame you are seeing here around this window is the one that the window manager put around the display window, not the one that originally came from XIs. You can grab the original frame this way. Now the XI's frame is part of the image and appears inside the display frame. You can grab the entire root window and everything it contains this way. Now the display command is trying to display the root window inside a window that's smaller than it is. That's what this little thing here in the center is for. My graphics move a little slowly over the network because I have a 10 base T which is very slow and I've got a 486 on the system that I refuse to give up so it'll stay slow. If you have access to a remote Linux X system, you can reach out and grab a snapshot of its window. This command gets a snapshot of the root window on the computer named Arlen. You can do this because the images actually come from the X server, so all that was necessary here was for this computer to have access to the X server on Arlen, so XWD could request a screen image from the X server over there. Now in my work I take a lot of screenshots of all sorts of things. Some of these require setup, that is I want to configure the screen a certain way and have XWD take a shot of it before the focus changes. A lot of time I need to bring a specific window to the front or pull down a menu or something and get that in the shot. That can be done with a little script. I call this one grab root. It lets me take a root window shot and then I can trim it down to what I need. All it does is sleep for a few seconds before taking the snapshot. That's long enough for me to get the focus where I want it or do whatever setup I want to do. I can even have time to switch to another workspace if I need to. L let me show you how this works. Alright, I know you couldn't hear it, but there's a small beeping sound when XWD takes a picture. That lets me know that it's done. Now, look at this.
there's the picture of the menu, which I couldn't have gotten if I didn't have the mouse free to pull it down. The only thing I can't get is the cursor, but I've gotten by that by storing some cursor images in separate files and editing them in where I need them. It may be cheating a bit, but it works. Coming up is some more stuff about that display command and the command that converts one image file type to another. This lesson is about the display and convert utilities. Display will open a window and display any graphic file and it will allow you to perform edits on it. The convert utility will convert directly one graphic file format into another. The files I'm loading and showing are all JPEGs, but they could be GIFs, PNGs, PCXs, or any one of a dozen or so other formats. The display routine checks the type when it loads them. Now this checking is done using the file algorithm it has nothing to do with a suffix on the name of the file. The suffix name is there for you and me. Clicking the mouse on the image, anywhere on the image, will produce a menu that you can use to control the view and perform any one of a number of modifications. For example, the image can be rotated 90 degrees to the right. And any change you make can be reversed. You can perform special effects of various types. And once you've got it the way you like it, you can save it under the same name or create a new file with a different name. You can even use a different format to save the file. Some of these you probably have never heard of. Here's one that's fairly common. Here's a photograph I took out of my back window one day, just as it was getting dark. Iliamna was spouting off a little smoke, but I got a dark picture of it. Let's see if I can bring anything out of it. That didn't do too much. Let me try just brightening it up. Mm, no, that's even worse. I don't think there is any detail in the trees at the bottom. Let me just normalize it and see what happens. That's better, but there's just nothing at the bottom. Let me trim the picture down some so I can leave out the stuff with nothing in it. There. Now that's not the picture I hoped it would be, but it's a little clearer than it was. Let me save this in another format.
As you can see, there are lots of formats available. Now as you can see, you can load up any graphic file you want in the display program and convert it to any other format just by saving it. But there's a quicker way. A companion program to display is called Convert, and it just converts any image file from the command line. It's as easy as copying a file, for example. This is, I suppose, the exception that proves the rule. In this case, the format of the output file is determined by the suffix on the name of that new file. No matter what the format of the input file, the format of the output is determined by its name, like this. This is about mTools. It's a set of tools that provide access to the DOS file system. It can be useful on a dual boot machine where you have decided not to mount the DOS Windows file system, but mostly it's used for providing access to DOS floppies. Of course, you could just mount the floppy using the appropriate file system type, but if you're already familiar with DOS commands, these tools can be quicker and easier. Everything is emulated, even the drive letter followed by a colon to identify the disk drive. But you can use Unix style regular expressions for pattern matches on file names. The general rule is that if you can do it in DOS, you can do it in mTools. For example, you can change a floppy without unmounting and remounting a new one. The differences are that you can do some things with mTools that you can't do in DOS. Where there is a collision between the two systems, the Unix format wins. For example, the options on the command line begin with a minus sign instead of a slash as they do in DOS. This is the configuration file for mTools, but it's unlikely that you'll have to change it because the defaults are probably what you want. A colon is the first floppy drive and B colon is the second. If you want to do something special like access a CD-ROM or a zip drive or something, it would be best if you went to the mTools website and looked into the documentation. A link to that website is on the web page that I gave you earlier. Anyway, I have created a DOS floppy with a few files on it to show you how the commands work. The commands all have the same names as the DOS commands, except they all begin with the letter M to prevent confusion with other Linux commands. For example, there is a DIR command on Linux that works like this. So the mTools version of it begins with the letter M and works like this. As you can see, there is a directory named data on this floppy disk, and you can change to that directory with the mcd command, like this. Now I'm sure you noticed that I used the front slash instead of the backslash in the path names. That's because the bash shell still has this attitude about backslashes, so you always need to use the regular slashes in path names. You switch back to the root directory of the floppy disk this way. Of course, you can use the path name with MDIR to look into that directory. You can copy files on the DOS drive with the mcopy command. You can even use mcopy to copy files between Linux and DOS. For example, here in my home directory I have a file named log. I can copy it to the floppy this way.
You see, mCopy looks at a file name, and if it begins with a letter and a colon, it knows it's a DOS file. Otherwise, it's assumed to be a Linux file. It can copy in either direction, and it can copy from DOS to DOS. And if the file being copied is ASCII text, it automatically translates the line feeds and carriage returns. And it's just as easy to delete a file. You can get a listing of the usage of the DOS disk with the MDU command and the A option. The size of a file is listed as a number of clusters. It's a DOS thing. If you want to find out how many clusters there are and how big a cluster is, you can use mInfo this way. The mmd command can be used to create a new directory. There are several other commands. If you want to use these utilities, I suggest you check out the documentation at the website. Some of the commands have several options. When I wind up needing to access a floppy, I find that I need about three commands to do the job I want to do. But you can do just about anything you'd like. For example, you can remove a directory and all of its contents this way. And, of course, you can always format the floppy disk. There are plenty of mTools commands. There is even an mzip to compress the files on the DOS floppy. This lesson is about dumping the contents of files with a utility named OD. The name OD is an acronym for Octal Dump. This is a very old programmer's utility from the early days of Unix. In those days, it was not uncommon to debug a program by examining the binary code produced by the assembler. And that binary code was presented in the form of octal digits. This is not such a common practice today except in certain kinds of embedded systems, but from time to time, the occasion seems to arise that nothing else will give you what you want and you have to examine the innards of a file. To do that, you need OD. Now OD can be used to dump out the contents of any file, but for purposes of this demo, I'm going to use a very short file of ASCII text. That will make it easier to see what we've got. Here's the file. Now here's an octal dump of that file. That's the default format of an OD dump. The first column is the address in the file of the first byte in the row. The other eight columns are the contents, with each octal value representing 16 bits. That's right, 16 bits. I told you this was an old utility. Stranger than that, however, is that the address information in the first column is hexadecimal and is a 32-bit number. You probably don't want to use octal. I find it hard to read. The digits in an octal number are 0 through 7. Each digit represents 3 bits, and each word is 16 bits long, and 3 goes into 16 5 times with 1 left over. So this first digit of the octal number represents only 1 bit. The other 5 digits each represent 3 bits. I find hexadecimal easier to read, and you can get that with the X option. Same data, but now each digit represents 4 bits. Things come out even because 4 goes into 16 exactly 4 times, so each of the 4 digits represents 4 bits. But we don't have enough digits to carry this all the way to 15, so we throw in A for 10, B for 11, and so on until F for 15. Now look at that very first 16-bit value. The one that shows up is 6F4E. Those are the hexadecimal values for the first two characters. A capital N is represented by 4E, and a lowercase o is represented by 6F. That's right, they're backwards. It's the Intel thing of swapping the bytes of every 16-bit value. 
When the Intel chip loads a 16-bit value, it swaps the bytes. It's best not to dwell on this too much except to be aware that it has taken years of hard work and head scratching to overcome this oddity and the software you work with every day handles this for you automatically. But it does look odd. Look at the very last 16-bit value. The 0A is the new line character marking the end of the name Kelly. And the byte to its right, 79, is the ASCII letter Y, the last letter of the name. We can actually use OD to give us the ASCII form and the hexadecimal form all at once. Notice that while the hexadecimal values are just as they are in the file, OD politely swaps the characters to put them in the right order for us. These are the most common formats, but you can also get decimal numbers and they look like this. And you can mix the types like this. You can even translate whatever binary data is in the file as if they were floating point values with exponents and all, like this. That's probably the most useless format, unless of course you happen to have a file that contains blocks of floating point numbers. There are other options, for example you can instruct OD to skip to a certain location in the file before it starts dumping data. You can change the number of bytes output on each line. You can get a quick summary of all of the options this way. This lesson is to introduce you to some of the simpler utilities that come with Linux. As you explore the system, you'll find more and more of these little programs. There are lots of them. Just to give you an idea, I can use LS to do a quick count of the number of programs in user bin. And that's not all of them. The system programs are in bin. and the X programs. So what I'm going to show you isn't even a beginning. One utility that I have found useful on some very odd occasions is a program called Strings. It reads through a file, usually a binary file, and displays any strings of text it finds embedded inside the file. That's the list of character strings in the binary program LN used to create file links. The strings program has options that you can use to make your string search a bit more specific. The xmag program can be used to magnify a specific spot on your screen. You move this little half frame cursor around and select a spot you want to magnify. You can see how something like this could be useful in exploring the details of something graphic. It's got menus and such and you can grab other magnifications and what have you by controlling it from here. There is even an old graphics version of the man pages. Now, this has its own set of instructions. This program is designed to be something that you start and leave running. That way you'll be able to go directly to the man page you want with a few mouse clicks. Whether you use this or use the regular command line version is up to you, but it's here if you want it. The checksum utility can be applied to a file to produce a CRC number and a count of the number of bytes in the file. The CRC number, cyclical redundancy check, is a number that you can use to verify whether or not the file has been modified. Any change to the file will change the CRC number. To use it, you just use the name of the file as its argument this way.
This is the CRC number of a file that contains 602 bytes. Now this number can be used to verify that every byte in a file is correct after the file has been transmitted from one computer to another. If you have two files that are supposed to be identical, you can check that using CMP. It compares any two files and reports the first difference it finds. To show you how it works, I've made a copy of my bash profile file and changed a line toward its end. These are character files, but it works just as well on binary files. There's a simple email program that you can use to send something to anyone. It's flexible, it can be used in lots of ways, and this is probably the simplest way. Any internet email address will work, but this command mails a copy of my bash profile to the root user over on Arlen. There is a simple FTP program with a very intuitive interface. Up at the top you can select the remote FTP site and the program will connect it for you. In the panel on the left you select your local directory, on the right you select the remote directory. The arrows in the middle can be used to copy selected files back and forth. The bookmarks up at the top can be used to connect you to a remote FTP site and at the same time select the correct local directory. I've used this a lot and I've found it to be very easy and very handy to use. Just about anything you want is either already installed or can be downloaded. To wrap up this list, here is a little utility that's been around for a long time. Many people put the fortune command in their bash profile so they get a new fortune every time they log in. I don't know how many fortunes there are in its database, but it never seems to repeat. I know that if I kept at it, someday it would repeat something, but I don't have that kind of patience. I suppose I could look in and see how many it has. This lesson is about shutting down your Linux system. A clean shutdown is achieved by switching to the shutdown run level. You should remember the run levels. They're defined in init tab. As you can see, there are two shutdown levels. Level 6 will shut the system down and cause it to immediately reboot. A real shutdown is level 0. It goes down and stays down. That's the more common case. Normally you want to shut the system down to move the computer or to diddle around with the hardware or something. Just about everything else can be done with the system up. To do any of this, you must be logged in as root. Linux protects itself from being shut down by any of the users except those with superpowers. You can achieve a switch to any other run level with a telinit command. Now this command sends a message to init, which responds by switching to the other run level. For example, this computer is now in run level 5, the one for X. To switch immediately to the single user mode, which is run level 1, you enter the command like this. Now, if I were to hit the return key, all the windows would close and the services would be shut down. You remember the start and stop scripts in the rc.d directory. All the ones in the directory rc1.d would execute and that would stop most of the services. Then a single, non-windowed login prompt would appear on the Linux console. Normally in single user mode you would log in as root and do some sysadmin stuff. When you are finished, use telenet again to switch back back to level 5. Now, this is not a reboot. This is a change of run level with the same kernel still running. 
You can use Telenit to switch from any run level to any other run level. Because of the start and stop structure of the scripts in the rc.d directory, only the services and all the services for the new run level will be running. You see, there's no harm in trying to stop a service that's not running. And the same is true, it has no effect to try to start a service that's already running. While Telenet can be used to bring the system down immediately, there is a better way. A program named Shutdown will switch to a shutdown run level, but it does it in a much kinder way. It delays the action a bit while it warns all the users that are currently logged in. That's meant to give everyone time to save their stuff and log out. At the same time, Shutdown disables logins, preventing anyone else from getting on the system before it goes down. Now it has command line options that specify the exact operation. If you don't specify, the computer goes to run level 1, the single user mode. Or you can specify the R option and the machine will reboot, or specify the H option to have the system halt and wait to be powered down. You can specify when the shutdown is to occur. For example, this command will cause the system to go to power off condition at 11.30. Or this one would cause the system to switch to single user mode at 11.30. Alright, now let's do it for real. The following command shuts the system down and reboots and it warns everybody that it's going to do it. Notice the warning message appeared on both logins. What happens now takes several minutes in real time, but I'm going to edit each period of time down to just a few seconds so you can see the process, so get ready for shutdown.